I was thrown out of my doctor's office. I was thrown out of the city of Phoenix, the state of Arizona. I was thrown out of Denver. I was thrown out of the United States. I was will not let into Japan. I thought, what do I do? Came the phone call from Sweden saying, if you come there, we will take care of all your expenses and meet you at the airport. And I thought, oh, at that point, you know, and, and then you feel like you've got a time bomb inside of you. I thought, you know, it, the, the meter's running. This is something central to a woman's life, to her dignity. It's a decision that she must make for herself. From Kansas, Kentucky, and North Carolina, dedicated women marched. Abortion is fast becoming the new political fault line. Alabama's governor has signed the nation's strictest abortion ban into law. The Human Life Protection Act outlaws the procedure except when the mother's life is at risk. This bill is not about pro-life or the right to life. This bill is about control. We will not go back. The people of the United States of America, documented or undocumented, are having abortions, legal or not. This court will never stop us. Welcome back to Ordinary Equality. I'm Kate Kelly, human rights attorney and feminist activist. And I'm Jamia Wilson, a writer, editor, and feminist activist this episode, we're taking you back to a time before Roe versus Wade. To give you a sense of the time, we're going to start by telling you the story of a woman who made international news in 1962. Okay, my name is Sherry Chesson. Unfortunately, you may know me as Sherry Finkbein, but that is not my name. It never was my name. The press gave me that name because, ladies, in 1962, you couldn't be yourself. If you got married, whambo, you had his name and and not your own. So I am Sherry Chesson, period. The pop goes the weasel and the jack-in-the-box jumped out of his house. And that means it's time for the Zonko Room School. Sherry was the host of the Phoenix, Arizona version of the TV show Romper Room. How are my friends this morning? Are you all fine? Well, we have a very special day with us today and a very special person. Our friend Keith is having a birthday. The romper room was really preschool for four and five years old. Uh, We were on the air every day for an hour playing with six kids. There was a lot of jumping around, riding on horses, little kids banging into you with them, um, drinking chocolate milk. It was nursery school. Sherry found herself pregnant with her fifth child, a wanted pregnancy. But she discovered, along with the rest of the world, that the drug she was taking for morning sickness, thalidomide, could cause severe birth defects. Sherry decided she needed to terminate her pregnancy right away. While trying to arrange her abortion, Sherry called the local newspaper and told them all about the dangers of thalidomide. Though she asked that her name not be used in the story, the local paper made it too easy to identify who she was. Subsequent articles ran in the national press, with Sherry's name included. At that point in Arizona, abortions were only allowed if they were deemed medically necessary. So, with the help of lawyers, Sherry was evaluated by a psychiatrist in an attempt to argue that she was a mental health risk. But... The psychiatrist's visit wasn't exactly what she expected. And I walked in, sat very primly on my chair, and you know what he said? Would you like a donut? I said, a donut? Don't you want to ask me any questions? And he says, no, nah, it's all figured out, you know, and everything. And he says, here's the paper. You better stay in here for half an hour. Or they won't think I asked you the right things. But calls and threats against Sherry flooded in. Someone even went into the county attorney's office, saying they wanted to make a citizen's arrest to keep her from getting the abortion. With all the backlash, Sherry's doctor said he was no longer interested in performing the abortion. 
Sherry and her husband searched the country for a willing doctor. Then, Sherry searched the world. She decided to travel to Japan in hopes she could receive the care she needed. Terrified of the press, she donned a disguise and rushed through the airport. And so I remember dressing up. I am a brunette, and I'm dressing up with a blonde wig. And then I was only about two and a half months pregnant, so it wasn't showing. And I took towels and put them in like a real pregnant lady. And I can still, as I describe what I did, I can still hear my heart going boom, boom, boom. Boom. I thought, oh, my God, they're going to see my heart. And my husband walked way far behind me. And so we got through the airport and there were no pictures from Phoenix. Got to L.A. and my mother's friend met us and we got into her car and she her daughter was driving. And she said, oh, my poor dear, I didn't know you were so pregnant. And I started pulling the towels <laughs> and everything. That night we were watching TV and there was a show called, um, his name was Joe Pine. He was interviewing a doctor and he said, in the light of all that you know, doctor, do you blame Mrs. Finkbein for doing what she's doing? And the doctor said, no, I do not. And here's the shocker. Joe Pine, the host said, neither do I. Despite that glimmer of hope, the Japanese consul denied Sherry her visa. They didn't want more American women traveling to the country in search of abortions. Sherry was cast out once again. Finally, Sherry and her husband found a solution. She found doctors in Sweden willing to perform the procedure. Her plight had become international news. What are your plans uh, after Sweden? I don't want to sue anybody. I don't want any money from anybody. I, I, I don't want to get back at anybody. I don't no. feel bitter towards anyone. I, I don't feel bitter towards people who oppose us religiously. I only hope that they know, can feel that we're doing what's best in our case and, yeah. and, and could feel some of what's in my heart in trying to prevent a tragedy from happening. After her abortion, Sherry returned home. There were no protesters with signs in the airport since the highly vocal anti-choice movement didn't exist as we know it today. Sherry's story was just the beginning. But Sherry did face significant career consequences. And we flew back to Phoenix. And the vice president of NBC in Phoenix said to me, Sherry, we decided you're no longer fit to handle children. And uh, they took my job away. Still, she has no regrets about her decision to have the abortion. She sees it as the thing that allowed her to have two more children. Now that it's all over, do you still think that you've done the right thing? More than ever. Something within me, I don't know if it was womanly intuition or the God inside of me said, don't have this baby, and I didn't, and uh, now I know it was the right decision. Women across the United States faced powerful stigma before the Roe v. Wade decision in 1973. Most weren't able to escape on an all-expense-paid trip to Sweden for their abortions. So what did they do? As we learned in episode two, women have taken their reproductive destinies into their own hands for millennia. Even after abortion was criminalized in the 19th century, the United States was no different. In the 1950s and 60s in particular, it's estimated that between 200,000 and 1.2 million women sought illegal abortions per year. That's according to the Guttmacher Institute, a research and policy group dedicated to advancing reproductive health. These illegal abortions weren't always safe. Law-defying organizations popped up all over the country to provide clandestine abortions. Some with good intentions, some not so much. Anyone who got involved risked losing their jobs or winding up in jail. Today, we're going to talk about two underground organizations founded to help women safely navigate illegal abortions. As we learn from the past, it's important to remember it isn't entirely behind us. With the conservative Supreme Court and restrictive abortion laws passing in many states, we're closer to this old reality than many realize. Let's go back to church for a second. Last episode, 
We talked all about the perspectives that different religious traditions bring to abortion. Many faith groups, like Catholics and often white evangelicals, are so vocal about their opposition to abortion today that it's easy to forget some traditions have moral arguments for abortion. This first organization used those religious arguments to the fullest. It's the Clergy Consultation Service, or CCS. Here's Reverend Katie Zay, CEO of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice and co-host of the Kindreds podcast. There is this amazing history that many people don't know about, which is the Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion, which was a super robust network of clergy and laity across the United States who did a number of things in the years leading up to Roe. First, they would find reputable abortion providers, whether they were in the United States or outside of it, that would not take advantage of pregnant people who are looking for care. That's right. While abortion services were openly advertised in every major newspaper in the 1800s, in the 1960s, it was illegal for them to advertise. Thousands needed to know where to go to terminate a pregnancy, since that information was not publicly available. In addition to tips they heard on the grapevine or from friends, one major source people could turn to for referrals to get legal and illegal abortions pre row was actually a group of religious leaders. The Clergy Consultation Service started in 1967. By 1971, two years before the Roe decision, there were over 2,000 ministers and rabbis in the CCS across the country. It started in, in New York City at Judson Memorial Baptist Church. They had a dedicated phone line that people would call, and there was a referral process that people would go through. And they also had members of the of the clergy consultation service who would visit the providers or even ask their secretaries. Their secretaries would pose as pregnant people and make sure that the people who are being referred to would actually provide care that was compassionate and that they weren't trying to take advantage of people financially. So there was this whole system, and I think it looked different depending on where folks were and what was available. There were also people providing referrals to, you know, go outside of the United States if that was the closest place. I know there were many referrals made to doctors in Mexico City at the time. A large part of the clergy consultation service was also their public advocacy. Many made sermons and speeches, while others directly challenged district attorneys and state politicians. They argued that restricting abortion was actually a restriction on religious liberty. In doing this, many clergy members were risking prosecution. But this work didn't carry the same kind of stigma that you might expect today. This was something that generally was supported by the denominational bodies that these clergy were connected to. It wasn't looked down upon or stigmatized or shamed in the way that I think it is now for clergy who stand up for reproductive freedom. It was kind of an acceptable thing. It was seen as part of their ministry to make sure that people weren't dying from unsafe abortion in their communities. And sometimes the procedure took place in the building itself. While local officials in several states absolutely did try to find and prosecute their local clergy consultation service groups, this was actually pretty rare. Being a member of the clergy often provided a moral shield. Many of the ministers and rabbis acting as primary liaisons were also white men, in less vulnerable positions legally and financially. After the Roe v. Wade decision, CCS groups merged with local Planned Parenthoods, became their own organizations, or disbanded. The CCS umbrella organization evolved into the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. Yeah, I don't know about you, Jamia, but it's always surprising to me to learn about religious people who paved the way fighting for abortion access, because that's really not the story I was taught growing up. And that's not the story you hear. But when you hear that there were rabbis and priests getting clandestine abortions for women who needed them in the 1960s, (laughs) it kind of completely turns that idea on its head. Yeah, I remember, I think the first time that I heard about them was I watched some sort of documentary or some newsreel where I saw footage 
of proceedings. And I believe they were here in New York City and they showed clergy folks talking about compassion, talking about why they were doing this work and showing up for women in these legal proceedings. I always kind of had a nuanced view about clergy that you had you had clergy who were a part of, of fixing the social order in a way that those who had always been on top would remain on top and it would be a system of domination. And then those who were about helping to support the people who were most vulnerable, most marginalized, and specifically in a, a Christian context, this idea that I was taught that the meek should inherit the earth, for example. I think that I've had a nuanced view about it, but I also knew that it wasn't widely available, this conversation, and that there had been by design a takeover of the conversation by the religious right in order to place a moral imperative uh, among Republicans, in order to silence the vast majority of people of any political party who believe themselves to be pro-reproductive justice in this country, and to make them feel like if you are vocal about being pro-reproductive justice in this country, if you are a part of this party, then you become persona non grata. Anyone who's been listening to this podcast knows that I have a longstanding beef or problem with the fact that most clergy in most faiths is exclusively male and for many has exclusively been white. It's heartwarming to hear that there were people clergy specifically who saw it as their goal or as their mission to be allies. But I think it's this this act of solidarity, this this attempt to be an ally to a group that they cannot identify with and do not share a level playing field or or an equal platform that that I think is particularly inspiring. And this has to do with the gender gap we were talking about. But because of their relative privilege and position, the clergy consultation service was better poised to avoid legal consequences. But this next Chicago-based organization had to work under more cover and code. They were constantly at risk. It's the Abortion Counseling Service of the Women's Liberation Union, also known as Jane. So my name is Laura Kaplan. I'm the author of The Story of Jane. I was also a member of Jane, and that experience was my entree into the world of activism. In 1971, Laura was living in Chicago when her best friend from college experienced something many women have. She got unexpectedly pregnant. And she found Jane through an ad in some underground paper. And she came over to my apartment afterwards Uh, after her abortion, and she was so excited by the experience that she was almost literally bouncing off the walls, you know, that this was like something she hadn't expected at all. And I had been wanting to get involved in this new women's movement, women's liberation movement. I didn't have a particular interest in abortion. I'd come from a state that had pretty much legalized abortion, uh, New York. But what she was telling me sounded so exciting. She took me to meet her counselor, and they were just about to have a new counselor training session. Jane was formed in 1968 by Heather Booth, a student at the University of Chicago. Heather started out making referrals to willing abortion doctors, all by herself. But the number of requests grew so much that she quickly realized she would have to expand the group to make an impact. Heather passed around notepads at women's liberation conferences and gathered a network of women interested in helping with abortion access. After Laura stumbled upon the organization, she began to learn how it ticked. She started out as a counselor, the first position for all newbies. After successfully counseling for a while, a member of Jane could be scouted for other positions. First job was called Callback Jane. And, you know, we were really very uncreative with our names. And so Callback Jane called women back. We had one of the first answering machines. Our guy, who was the, um, in quotes, doctor, he supplied us with this answering machine. Nobody had answering machines. No cell phones. There was no technology, you know. So this answering machine was about the size of a suitcase, 
and it was real to real. So call back Jane, called the woman back and said, hi, this is Jane from Women's Liberation. You called us. Tell me why you called. And then we'd always want the woman to say why she called us, that she was looking for an abortion rather than us saying, oh, are you looking for an abortion? You know, just so that once again, the power was in her court at all times. And then we get basic medical information, her name, address, phone number. When the group was all women, we charged $100 of what you could afford. And so we get down what she thought she could afford and how many previous pregnancies and how many miscarriages and, you know, yada, 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 yada. The basic information, which got put on three by five cards. All of those little cards and documents were given to another role in the organization. Big Jane. And I wound up doing Big Jane, which was the main administrative job. So Big Big Jane scheduled our work days, made sure everybody had the address. Big Jane was on call 24 hours a day because, again, no cell phones, no answering machines, you know, and it was shared between two people at a time. Throughout her tenure at Jane, Laura did pretty much everything. On top of counseling and Big Jane, she drove women to their appointments and trained other members. Laura said that counseling was the bedrock of what Jane was about. For many women, this was their first opportunity to actually learn about their own bodies. We would say, we started out saying to women, because we saw so much of our work is educational, would you like to see your cervix? And, you know, 90% of the women would say no. So then we decided we weren't saying that anymore. We were going to say, here, look at your cervix. We really felt women needed to know. So there was this one woman, and we would say to them, also, if you want, we can set up the mirror so you could watch your whole abortion. But if we saw anyone who had an inkling of interest, we would say to them, you know, you could join us. This is who we are. Joining Jane was a risk for everyone, but for some more than others. The same biases that may have protected white ministers in the CCS from police intervention put women of color at much greater risk. Even the most interested and ambitious Black women hesitated to become a member of Jane, under risk of greater scrutiny and greater punishment from the law. And for the most part, women of color didn't join. And uh I always think of there's one woman who is a good friend of mine, and she did join. After her abortion, she asked if she could watch other women's abortions. And whoever was working that day said to her, well, it's their bodies. You have to go ask them. So she did. And she watched a bunch of abortions. And she told me she thought to herself, oh, I want to do this. Um, But when she told her friends, they said, are you crazy? You know? Those white women will get away with this, but you'll wind up in jail. They'll take your kids away. She had three children at that point. You don't do this. So I think a lot of that probably played into why, you know, the main route for joining Jane was through your own abortion didn't happen so often with women of color. You know, we did what we could, I think. And it was troublesome for us, you know, that we were a, primarily a white group and we were doing abortions uh, for predominantly poor black women. You know, that was a problem. But we were also so busy, you know, that we just had to, you know, focus on getting our work done. But we did reach out to women in counseling sessions, and um, during the abortion to say, you know, join us. We need the help. (laughs) And sometimes it happened and sometimes it didn't. In 1972, the police raided one of the apartments that the Janes used and arrested seven members. In the back of the police van, the women ripped up the index cards with their clients' information on them 
and ate the pieces. The Roe decision came down in January of the following year. It was the saving grace for the seven women who had been arrested. And soon after Roe, Jane disbanded. What I think is so interesting about Jane is, you know, that they were able to do so much with a grassroots underground network with caring individuals who knew what was at stake with relatively safe and accurate and accessible results. It's pretty amazing what people can do when you rely on community to come together and support each other with trust. Also, Jane is so fascinating because it's just such a concrete example of women saying, like, we cannot rely on the system. We cannot rely on doctors. We cannot rely on anyone but ourselves to get this done. And we're just going to do it. You know, I think today, you know, knock on wood, uh, we will never be in a position in any state in the United States where we will have to resort to performing our own abortions on ourselves. But I think that same spirit can inspire us whether or not we ever have to do the same things they did. I think we can operate in the same way in that we move forward unapologetic about the care that we need You know, when you think about movements throughout history that inspire us now, they essentially what they were doing was disobeying unjust laws. And that's what the Jane Collective did. So this is also what led us up to Roe. You know, when people think about Roe, they think like, oh, it was this like magical decision that came out of the sky and nine men on the Supreme Court decided to give us abortion access. No, no. Women, like the women who ran the Jane Collective, took that right for themselves and said, you can change the laws or you cannot change the laws, but we will have abortion, whether or not you change those laws. And that is the context in which we find ourselves getting the Roe decision. Which is so profound. When you're talking about unjust laws, I think about Martin Luther King's words when he said, an unjust law is a code that's out of harmony with the moral law. And we're talking about clergy, right? The moral law. And that was, you know, a big part of the last four years for me was just about what is a moral imperative right now? Is it moral for people to be forced into further poverty? Is it moral to force more human suffering, criminalization of their children at birth? I mean, just so many things for these women, from my assessment, and and I think, you know, what, what you're saying too, deciding that the moral law was higher than these unjust laws made by people for whom these laws served a profit purpose or a power purpose, not a moral purpose. I think it's really important uh, for us to be having these conversations because I do think that there's not enough critical conversation about the moral law. We've talked about two covert organizations that sought to help women obtain safe abortions. Many more existed throughout the country in the late 60s and early 70s. Another group of note was called the Army of Three, the title given to Rowena Gurner, Patricia McGinnis, and Lana Phelan. They answered thousands of letters from women seeking abortion support. The Army of Three eventually created the organization that would expand into the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws or NARAL Pro-Choice America. There were also many individuals trying to do their part. One of those individuals was Sherry Chesson. After her high-profile abortion, she started getting calls from desperate women in Arizona. And we found a place in Arizona where people could go, and I don't know if it was any good, but it still was on this side of the border, because they didn't know who else to ask. And when they would start to tell me, why they needed this. I said, please, I don't know want to know why that's private to you. That that's that's your business. And I didn't want to get the emotional part inside of me. I just wanted to help them because I wanted it to be their decision. It doesn't take a large network of resources and volunteers to be a good abortion ally. 
Sometimes it just takes some personal knowledge and the patience to be a listening ear. That's important no matter what decade we're talking about. We still need abortion advocacy groups and individual allies today. Despite the fact abortion is technically legal, several states have as few as one abortion clinic, and many in need don't have the means to travel. The New York City-based Haven Coalition was created 18 years ago. To this day, its volunteers offer places to stay for people who travel to the city for abortions. The Bridget Alliance provides funds and travel support for those seeking abortions. It was founded in 2018. The National Abortion Federation also provides those services. You can find their hotline in the show notes. By educating yourself about local abortion options and being willing to help those in need, you can carry out this work too. My uh, granddaughter, who is 18, she called me and says, Grandma, I'm doing a uh, paper on, on abortion. and What's going to happen to us if Roe v. Wade goes down? And I said, Anik, women will always find a way to have an abortion, but we don't want them to find any way, a way that where they're sticking um, knitting needles, you know, up themselves or doing back alley abortions like was history before my time. We want them to, you know, be in, in clean medical situations with a doctor who knows what he's doing, but they will always find a way. So I don't want you to worry about it one more day. I, I want you just to put all that sweet energy into helping it not happen. Over a decade after Sherry made international news, abortion became legal throughout the United States, thanks to one of the most iconic Supreme Court rulings ever, Roe v. Wade. Sherry's story was pivotal in leading up to Roe. As a sympathetic, white, educated TV personality and mother of four, she helped counteract stereotypes of what kind of woman needed an abortion. Sarah Weddington, the gal who litigated row when she was just 26 years old. And I have been on several programs together. And so I, you know, I feel that I know her. And she was up at our, the radio station where I was working one day. And she said, my case helped make her job in front of the Supreme Court so much easier. I don't know what she said to them or how they did, but I think it's that she captured a few hearts. At that time, it really showed that there is a need for a change in the laws. While Sherry helped win the hearts and minds of the folks in power, people in groups like Jane were sending the signal. If you won't make abortion legal, we're going to take it for ourselves anyway. That is the context in which Roe became possible. Amelia Bono, who's the co-founder of Shout Your Abortion, says in this incredible speech that she gave on the steps of the Supreme Court, which is at the top of our show, part of our montage, she says, uh, we, the people of the United States, documented or undocumented, are having abortions, legal or not. That's just a refreshing and different way to frame the entire conversation. <laughs> you know, and we've learned from these women, there is really only one way to assure that we will have access to this procedure, and that's to insist upon it no matter what. I think one of the things that this underscores is, you know, again, we as we have to talk about all the time on the show and as you talked about all during season one, why we need an ERA, right? Like, this is another example of why we need an ERA and why assumptions about protections don't translate into access or intersectional, widely available, positive experiences for everyone in need. I remember when I was working campaigns in South Dakota around two different anti-abortion ballot initiatives, I remember just hearing about people who were coming from many hours away from reservations very far away from the Sioux Falls affiliate who would struggle to have money to get gas to get to the services they needed, therefore prolonging the timing for them, therefore making it more complicated for them to get those procedures. And 
then when they would get there not having the money because of their circumstances and because of economic injustice, not having the money to stay in a hotel and needing to sleep in their car in order to have the procedure the next day and needing to take off work, not having child care for the kids that they needed to leave at home, maybe a six hour drive away or something like that. And so I think about those kinds of barriers too, um, that are those unseen barriers. Next week on Ordinary Equality, we're taking a break to bring you some real abortion stories, including some of yours. Leave us a voicemail at 516-636-3012, and your story may be included in the next episode. After that, we're returning with the tale of the case that changed everything, and why we should see the Roe v. Wade decision as the floor, not the ceiling for abortion access. Talk to you then! Ordinary Equality is a Wonder Media Network production, produced by Edie Allard, Grace Lynch, and Liz Smith. Our executive producer is Jenny Kaplan. Original theme music by Rachel Wardell. Special thanks to Janice Formicella and Taylor Williamson. We have a new Pineapple Street Studios show we're really excited to tell you about. Undistracted is a weekly intersectional feminist podcast hosted by activist, educator, our favorite person to follow on social media, and former host of Pod Save the People, Brittany Packnett Cunningham. Brittany will be speaking to the biggest thought leaders in today's social justice movements, from politicians and activists to artists and athletes. So far, that's included people like Valerie Jarrett, America Ferreira, Soledad O'Brien, Tracy Ellis Ross, Jenna Wortham, and WNBA legend Sue Bird. Plus, she'll catch you up on the latest feminist news you need to know. Enough with the insidious distractions, the noise, the BS. This new show will focus on what really matters, how we can create a more just world that works for all of us. Undistracted comes out weekly on Thursdays, so subscribe now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite podcasts to join the conversation.